As a rising tide of dread swallowed the last months of 2019, I dreamed that a white wolf appeared outside my house. She compelled me to follow, away from the safety of the city lights and out into moonlit fields. I struggled to keep pace and found my strength slowly ebbing until I collapsed beneath the midnight sky. As my eyes closed and a brilliant light enveloped me, some last shred of consciousness rose to the surface of my mind, long enough for me to recognize that this was the end of my life and I had been led here by the wolf at my door. This dream left me wondering, why is it the wolf at the door? How much does the origin of such an idiom reveal about our own history? And how did the wolf become so inextricably linked to death and calamity? This episode draws from an immense collection of myth and history, one that encompasses almost all of human existence. To explore every niche would be like trying to watch the formation of a stalactite, we could trace every drop of water as it slowly deposits minerals for an age, and yet not comprehend the final results. And so I've tried to identify what I believe are key points in our history, which embody the development of our story during that time. Let us then rewind the formation of all those stories, legends and lore, to a time when the cavern of human myth was largely empty, a time from which little trace remains to this day. Almost a thousand miles from its source in Germany's Black Forest, the Danube River cuts between two immense gorges, known as the Iron Gates. It was between the steep cliffs that, between 1964 and 1984, paleontologists hurried to uncover relics that were being disturbed from their rest by the construction of two hydroelectric dams between Serbia and Romania. These prehistoric artefacts, it soon emerged, dated from almost 13,000 years before present, and among the shells, teeth, antlers and bones was a single pendant crafted from a wolf's incisor. The long dead wearer of this object would have lived in a world now almost entirely alien to us. Today we know it as the early Mesolithic period, and at the midpoint of the Stone Age, this artifact is among the oldest surviving relics of man's fascination with the wolf. From the moment our ancestors' brains had developed a capacity to believe in the supernatural, arguably the most basic definition of early religion and anthropology, the wolf seems to have occupied an important role in our beliefs. It's no accident that representations of prey animals in prehistoric art, such as the beautifully preserved images in the Lascaux Caves of southwestern France, vastly outnumber those of predators. In the eyes of Stone Age hunter-gatherers, there was little need to depict the wolf. After all, they could become it. Donning pelts of fur and wearing amulets of their teeth, our ancient ancestors almost certainly attempted to harness or invoke the wolf's power. Though some articles of clothing have in fact survived the immense breadth of time separating our ages, our best knowledge of their application may actually be gained from an entirely different source. Below the sparse vegetation which speckles the arid plains of Turkey's Konya province, the ruins of the Stone Age city of Satolhoyuk reveal beautifully preserved hunting scenes on their excavated walls. These appear to depict the participants wearing stiff skirts painted with dark dots, which bear a strong resemblance to stretched and prepared leopard skins. 
This offers us a glimpse into a practice that was likely widespread throughout Eurasia in various forms, of imitating powerful large carnivores in their hunting practices. Invoking the power of these animals to encourage a successful hunt also helped lay the foundations for totemism and shamanism, seeing favoured animals becoming central to our superstitions surrounding hunting and, inevitably, death itself. There is even evidence in the Czech Republic of ceremonial sacrifice of both wolves and humans, suggesting, as Professor Paul Pettit observed in 2010, the complex role of the dead in the cosmologies of the living, and that also occasions the ritual burial of animals such as wolves. Wolf and fox teeth certainly seem to have been incorporated frequently in ancient burials, such as the Paleolithic sites of Dolny Vestonish in the Czech Republic, where five skeletons were discovered, all buried with fox or wolf teeth. According to archaeologist Matthew Beresford, the wolf cult in prehistoric Europe was probably reflective of society's spiritual beliefs and was, in essence, a cult of death. It seems this association was so intuitive that, across the Atlantic, similar practices would give rise to the mythologies of the Native American tribes, perhaps most notably the Chilicotan of what would one day become British Columbia who believed that simply encountering a wolf could bring about nervous illness or death. Wherever the haunting, mournful sound of wolf song carried, it was woven into the beliefs of hunter-gatherer societies. Just what stories they must have told around their little islands of light and the primeval darkness as they listened to it will always be lost to us, as when the written word finally brought about the start of recorded history, the wolf began to occupy a very different place in the mind of communities. The transition from prehistory to recorded history swept across Europe with the advance of the Greek civilization and later the Roman Empire. From around 500 BC to 1500 AD, their innovative societies transformed and assimilated communities from Anatolia in the east the ruins of Satolhoyuk beneath their feet to Britannia in the west. This age of writing had a profound effect on how we understood the wolf, and it was accompanied by another transition, from that of the hunter-gatherer to the farmer. For those interested in classical history, Picturing the olive plantations or barley fields of ancient Greece may bring to mind the story of a young shepherd boy running down from the mountains, crying the alarm that wolves were attacking his flock. This was of course the work of a somewhat enigmatic storyteller by the name of Aesop, who, around 500 BC, regularly employed animals in his stories. These were by no means intended to be an accurate documentation of animal behaviour, Rather, he used them to demonstrate the vices and virtues of his fellow men. In this, one of his most famous examples, the boy who cried wolf enjoys causing alarm in his village by warning that wolves are attacking their sheep. That is, of course, until the community grows wise to his trick and subsequently fails to respond when his concern is genuine, thereby losing their entire herd to the predators. At the time, this served as a moral lesson for readers, but today it has taken on a new significance. So quickly vanished is the admiration and imitation of the wolf as a hunter, replaced by the threat of those instincts being turned on the domestic livestock that had come to represent the collective investment and livelihood of communities. For someone who had worked year-round to ensure the well-being of their livestock, and whose future depended on their safety, it would be hard to understand this as the instinctive behaviour of a carnivore, and instead attribute it to a personal attack, a theft of what was rightfully theirs. Indeed, in a later millennia, the phrase caput lupinum, or the head of a wolf, would become synonymous with an outlaw or felon in medieval England. Whether through admiration or aversion, 
Wherever wolves and culture coexisted in antiquity, we can find their impression upon myth and folklore. In Norse mythology, itself abundant with wolves, the god Odin created two such animals as his companions. Jerry and Threki, whose names both translate as greedy or ravenous, were said to feed upon those slain in battle, and their real-world counterparts were believed to carry the souls of the dead down to the underworld. The origin of this story may have its roots in observations of wolf behaviour. They are, after all, opportunistic carnivores, and as we have discussed previously on the channel, it is entirely possible that, during times of environmental stress, an anthropogenic battlefield can be an excellent source of food. Meanwhile, the wolf god Fenrir waited, bound by a magic rope, to wreak havoc on the world, while two of his children, Hati and Skull, chased the sun and moon until that day came about. The Icelandic poem Voluspa makes reference to this. There feeds he full on the flesh of the dead, and the home of the gods he reddens with gore. Dark throws the sun, and in summer soon come mighty storms, would you know yet more. Other examples of wolves being attributed to death or destruction can be found in Greek mythology. These include King Lycaon, transformed into one as his punishment for cannibalism, and Cerberus, the three-headed dog who guards the underworld. According to the contemporary geographer Pausanias, the city of Lycoria was possibly so named because the howling of wolves forewarned the residents of a natural disaster, allowing them time to evacuate. These demonstrate a slow expansion of the wolf's role from simply an embodiment of hunting and death to more general destruction and punishment. With the growth of Christianity, the wolf also became an increasingly popular symbol for deceit and wrongful intent. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Although, much like Aesop's fables, the wolf of the Bible was intended not as a literal description of the animal, but rather a metaphor for the hostile intent of other humans, the profound influence it had on Western attitudes towards the wolf can be felt to this very day, and much of the remainder of our story can be found to have been influenced by misinterpreted Christian teachings. Here we can afford to take a step back and watch as the centuries advance. The Roman Empire diminishes and the Middle Ages set in for a long and troubled chapter of human history. While the wolf rose in popularity as an antagonist, our attitude toward death would also undergo changes during this time. From the years 500 to 1500 AD, a new revulsion towards death began to emerge. Although still recognised as an essential part of all things, it began to develop into the expression of failure. As Philippe Aries noted in his lengthy text on the topic in 1974, death in the medieval mind meant not only judgement for one's actions in life, but weighed heavily upon them during it, a looming shadow that, as it drew ever closer, emphasised the value of what little time was available. Death was always present with him, shattering his ambitions and poisoning his pleasures, and that man felt a love of life which today we can scarcely understand. The growth of the church also encouraged a more severe judgement. Not only was a man judged by his actions in life, he was part of a greater reckoning that was foretold, and, in a way, this reckoning was already beginning to take place, with attitudes towards all living things likewise being polarised by what virtues they apparently had. And, unfortunately, the wolf was generally regarded as having none. 13th century writer Bartholomeus Anglicus describes the wolf in his 18th book, an attempt at an encyclopedia of animals. The wolf is an evil beast. When he eateth and resteth much, when he hath no hunger, 
he is foolhardy and loveth well to play with a child. If you may take him and slay him afterward, and eateth him at the last. Both habitat and tolerance for the wolf were fast being exhausted in this tamed world, reflected in accounts of increasingly frequent conflicts between wolves and expanding human settlements. Though often prone to exaggeration, it is clear from surviving texts that when deprived of natural prey, wolves' increased boldness could present a direct threat, further reinforcing their now widespread notoriety. Prudentius of Troyes, a chronicler some 400 years prior to Bartholomeus, recounts how in the west of the continent, wolves attacked and devoured with complete audacity the inhabitants of the western part of Gaul. Indeed, in some parts of Aquitaine, they are said to have gathered together in groups of up to 300, just like army detachments. This account in particular has been argued to actually describe a Viking raid, as opposed to wild animals, and the fact that we cannot be certain which was implied shows just how far the metaphor had already developed by the Middle Ages. In fact, one of the most forgiving portrayals of the wolf in the medieval period still falls short of completely excusing its existence. It is the tale of Saint Francis and the wolf, and is alleged to have taken place in the early 13th century. Whilst living in the city of Gubbio in Umbria, Italy, Saint Francis learned of a wolf that had been terrorising the local population, attacking and killing livestock and citizens alike, and with such ferocity that only those who were armed ventured beyond the safety of the walled city. Against their advice, Saint Francis set out alone and confronted the wolf at its den. Before it could attack him, he made the sign of the cross, forcing it to submit and lay at his feet. Then, according to the legend, he addressed it. Friar Wolf, thou dost much damage in these parts, and thou hast committed great crimes, destroying and slaying the creatures of God without his license. The wolf, compelled by this holy power, then agreed to a deal with the saints. The residents of Gubbio would provide food for the wolf, on the condition that it never harmed a living creature again. Saint Francis reasoned that it had been driven by hunger, and that satisfying this hunger would prevent further aggression. The very real natural compulsion to hunt live prey is here directly addressed as a sin and St. Francis uses this to compare the wolf's predatory nature with the work of the devil when he delivers a speech to the city's residents. Turn ye then, most dear ones, turn ye to God, and do befitting penance for your sins, and God will save you from the wolf in this present world, and from the fire of hell in that which is to come. The citizens place their faith in the protection of St. Francis and of God, and in keeping with its promise, the wolf walks among them without causing harm, no longer a threat so long as it is provided for. The story concludes thus. Finally, after two years, Friar Wolf died of old age, whereat the citizens lamented much because, as long as they saw him go so gently through their city, they recalled the better the virtue and sanctity of St. Francis. Although a sound moral lesson among men, note that at no point is any intrinsic value or redeeming quality recognised in the Wolf of Gubbio. The community projects its love for the saint upon it, but the animal becomes nothing more than a symbol of his influence and power over nature. As St. Francis himself explains, in taming the wolf, God has spared them from this creature, in much the same manner as he will save them from hell, should they convert. This brings us back to our opening statement for this chapter, that death and judgment weighed so heavily upon the medieval mind 
and that through faith there was yet hope for redemption, even if, like the Wolf of Gabeo, death would always have free reign through their cities and their homes. Only 150 years later would Englishman John Hardying write in his chronicle an immense and detailed, though largely mythic history of his country, the following lines. And do him new with noble sapience, by which he may the wolf be a fool negate. This phrase, which was already widespread at the time, remains in use to this day, albeit in a slightly modified form. To keep the wolf from your door is to have just enough money to eat and live. Whether any literal context was ever associated with it is unclear, however, the evident notoriety of the wolf by this point in history is unquestionably central to its adoption. I think this is one of the most important developments in our story, where previous myths that attempted to place an importance or a mechanism on the role of the wolf as a predator are totally and almost irretrievably lost. It becomes a destructive force without purpose, without reason other than to demonstrate the depths of sin, and in this respect it falls in line with the work of the devil. It is this that ushers in one of the darkest chapters of our story. In the year 1428, Delegates from seven districts along the border, between modern-day France and Switzerland, demanded an investigation by authorities into allegations of witchcraft. The process of this was simple. Any individual who three or more people could denounce as a witch was to be arrested. If they readily confessed, they would be burned at the stake. If they protested their innocence, they would be tortured into confession then burned at the stake. This horrific practice saw upwards of 367 citizens consumed by fire, and of those, a few cases involved what at the time was a largely original accusation, that the condemned had taken the form of a wolf in order to attack their neighbour's livestock. Those who suspected such attacks may well have been almost correct in their assumptions. During this era, wolves were abundant in France, and conflict was relatively common. Yet, because of their predisposition to an occult mechanism, this was not attributed to predatory animals whose territory had been whittled away at, but to a witch's shapeshifting a distorted remnant of the shamanistic beliefs we discussed in part one, and which could no longer be tolerated by the church. This was the earliest recorded instance of an accusation of lycanthropy, the practice of becoming a wolf, and as the European witch trials gained momentum throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, further confessions would destroy the line between fiction and reality as thoroughly as the accused were destroyed physically. It was in 1598, near Angers, western France, that a small group of villagers picking their way along a remote forest trail chanced upon the mutilated remains of a 15-year-old boy. As they approached the body with what must have been more than a slight apprehension, the travellers became aware that they had company. Three wolves, disturbed from their macabre feast, fled for the safety of the undergrowth. With at least one of their number being armed, the group abandoned the road and gave chase, only to stumble upon an even more disturbing sight. Half naked and covered in blood, stood 35-year-old Jacques Rollet. When brought before the court that same year, Rollet readily confessed to murder, and informed the judge that not only was he a werewolf, but the two other animals witnessed had in fact been his brother Jean, 
and cousin Julian. His confession was said to include dates and locations of similar murders, unequivocally proving his guilt. Yet in an unlikely twist, Rollet was spared execution to be rehabilitated. For reasons likely known only to himself, this man chose to incorporate the real wolves that had been feeding on his victim into his own fictional story to support it. It is then understandable that people of the late Middle Ages found reason to fear the wolf more than at any other time in history. They believed that under its guise, even a respected individual in the community could indulge their vilest desires without consequence, some of which made the cannibalism of Jacques Rollet appear tame in comparison, and even today, the concept presents a morbid fascination for many of us. As the 17th century drew to a close, the then recently retired 67-year-old Parisian Charles Perrault successfully published the first written collection of fairy tales, Tales and Stories of the Past with Morals. After six centuries of oral retelling, he finally brought to the world's attention the fate of a young girl in a red cloak, who allowed herself to be fooled by a cunning wolf that had devoured her grandmother and subsequently would do likewise to Little Red Riding Hood herself. Although the story was neither alone nor original in its depiction of the wolf by this point, it was in this more accessible printed form that countless children of first the nobility and later on those of lower classes were introduced to a creature that represented a young woman's potential for absolute failure and, much like the werewolf of the preceding centuries, the darkest intents of man. Over the course of the next two centuries, the wolf would disappear from much of Europe and North America. Where wolves banished from the landscape, their ghosts would remain through stories such as Little Red Riding Hood, The Werewolf, Jacques Rollet, St. Francis and the Wolf, Aesop's Fables and of course, John Hardying's lasting quotes. This notion of the wolf as a destroyer, inciting chaos and bloodshed wherever it went, received one of its most profound contributions as Europe, along with the rest of the world, descended into a chaos of its own, just 20 years after the horrors of World War I. Adolf, a name that requires little introduction in this context, can be traced back to German Ethelwolf, or Noble Wolf. This perhaps explains why, in 1922, Hitler wrote how a wolf has been born destined to burst upon the herd of seducers and deceivers of the people. And burst upon the herd it did, revelling in and employing wolf symbolism within the dreaded U-boats and SS alike. The ferocity and cunning, deceit and bloodlust of our own history projected onto the wolf had become everything that it was to us. It's the emptiness that's left. It is like a despair. Destroy his world. And I have been trying to help him. The mid-20th century finally afforded the wolf unbiased scientific study for the first time. After a millennia or more as the embodiments of ruin and death, our receding prejudice laid bare an unexpected irony. It is largely through the habits of bloodshedding and destruction we had condemned for so long that the wolf augments its environment. Perhaps the Stone Age hunter who once notched dependent from a wolf tooth on the banks of the Danube, also understood that where wolves hunted, the land and the prey were healthy. 
Today, we know that as a keystone species, wolves can exert a disproportionate and generally positive influence on other populations at every trophic level through their predation. Whether it is by selective hunting of ungulates, helping prevent lethal disease in herds, allowing suppressed local fauna to thrive by preventing overgrazing, keeping mesopredator populations in check, or providing food for scavengers such as ravens and bears through their kills, the losses attributed to this species are far outweighed by the stability it promotes. And what of the wolf at our door? Can we apply this same insight to an expression? The wolf has indeed been waiting patiently at the door of our civilization, but not necessarily to end it. Our modern way of life is both unsustainable and harmful, yet we often choose to pursue it with a blind eye to the consequences. Yet, just as the introduction of the wolf to an ecosystem does not necessarily bring about its collapse, the metaphorical one waiting at the threshold of our modern age need not be the harbinger of failure and demise that we dread, but of the change and sacrifice necessary to our continued evolution. And, just as in the dream we opened this episode with, it is high time we welcomed it.